Hi, hi everyone. Hi, DEF CON. Uh, my name is Alex Hoekstra. I am a molecular biologist and I'm one of the co-founders and scientists at the Rapid Deployment Vaccine Collaborative, or RADVAC. Uh, I'm excited and I'm grateful to, uh, to talk to the Biohacking Village about open source technology in vaccine development, uh, and building the kind of tools that fill gaps in global vaccine infrastructure. Uh, my goal in this session is to present the case for open source vaccine development uh, and the tools that enable that kind of development, which uh, at RADVAC we've begun to think of as developer kits or vaccine developer kits. Um, because it's very clear that uh, vaccines are a uniquely important tool in biosecurity. Uh, and there's so much more room for improvement in various facets of vaccinology, especially with regards to access. Um, we think that many aspects of vaccinology should and uh, with the right kind of tools can be made more accessible for more people in more places around the world. Uh, and that uh, the, the vaccinology itself uh, could grow and be improved uh, by that kind of inclusive participation. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously all kinds of gaps revealed in public health infrastructure and, and biosecurity. Uh, and there's more reason than ever to think seriously and creatively about how to fill these various gaps going forward. Uh, I guess both for uh, the ongoing reality um, for billions of us um, still struggling through COVID uh, and this pandemic, but also for inevitable future emerging diseases, uh, which we might be able to minimize and even prevent the right tools. So I want to introduce our work by discussing some concepts regarding vaccines that I think me will be familiar to a lot of people here who are already familiar with the space, but I also want to get into some hopefully exciting and new ideas for a lot of people across the biosciences. Um, since vaccinology has been heavily shaped by IP laws uh, for the last seven or so decades, uh, there's a lot of room for creative improvement, especially when you begin thinking kind of outside that, that box. Um, I think it's important to bring up a few foundational topics like uh, vaccine economics uh, and, and the unique role of, that vaccines play in epidemiology and uh, as well as, as the immunology as it relates to uh, vaccine platforms or, or the technology themselves. So we'll take a quick look at those issues before um, we get into you know, what RADVAC is doing in particular, because I think they're helpful in identifying the gaps uh, and why they exist presently. Um, ultimately, I do want to get into uh, what we've been doing at RADVAC in, in terms of open source efforts, uh, what open source efforts can do to kind of bridge those economic, technical, and logistical gaps. Uh, we at RADVAC have been working on, on building a particular platform for intranasal uh, peptide-based vaccine candidates against SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but we also think that uh, these, these principles of development may be more valuable in their generalizable form than any single um, development project on its own. So I want to get into why vaccines are uniquely important, uniquely leverageable tool in public health and defense against infectious disease. Uh, vaccines serve to combat disease in a number of ways, primarily by inhibiting infection, inhibiting disease, inhibiting transmission, and inhibiting replication, which subsequently um, inhibits mutations and the evolution of new pathogens. Uh, and although there are a variety of important and even very useful tools to achieve some of these functions, vaccines are arguably the most important. Uh, the Swiss cheese model uh, is something that I'm borrowing from Ian McKay, who adopted a, uh, a similar illustration for COVID. And although mine uh, is only showing a handful of risk prevention interventions uh, and isn't really to scale in terms of each intervention's efficacy, it's stopping pathogens from infecting a person. Uh, I think the illustration is still a useful one insofar as uh, it makes the case for applying multiple layers, additive layers to mitigate risk. Uh, vaccines, though, are unique among these interventions because they both augment a person's ability to fight off an infection if the prior layers of uh, protection fail. But also, if applied at scale across the population, vaccines can limit the collective exposure to these pathogens by reducing the number of available hosts and transmitters. And in the next slide, we're going to get into just a little bit of math. I promise it won't be, uh, it won't be too much, and, and that'll be the end of the math. Um, but essentially, the network effects may be one of those important features to vaccines, uh, which are good on a personal level, right? good for individual health, but so much better uh, on, on population scale. Right? Uh, but a lot of things have to go right in order to achieve those population scale network effects. Uh, and as of now, as of July 2021, almost a full 16 months after the first COVID vaccines uh, were actually developed, and now seven months after those vaccines were authorized and made available in the US and other high income countries, we're still not yet achieving the full benefit 
um, or benefits of those network effects on disease prevention uh, that these vaccines could uh, and hopefully will soon provide once they're made more accessible and, and more widely deployed. So there's a good amount of math involved with uh, considering how to prevent or end a pandemic, accounting for things like population characteristics, age, health status, mobility, environmental conditions, uh, and a lot more. But one of the most important concepts is understanding the effective reproductive number for a given disease. Uh, effective reproductive number is sometimes written as R or R sub E, uh, and it's a bit different from basic reproductive number, which is uh, you know more commonly talked about. It, it's uh, R naught or R sub zero, um, because uh, effective reproductive number uh, or R sub E uh, basically takes into consideration the percentage of a population that's susceptible to infection, essentially the percentage uh, that is not immune, um, sometimes written as, uh, as S. So R naught, on the other hand, is uh, is meant to be a metric of a disease's contagiousness or a transmissibility. Now, you can calculate effective reproductive number by multiplying the basic reproductive number by S. So killing a pandemic uh, requires if, uh, bringing that effective reproductive number to under one. Uh, since the spread of infectious disease is essentially an exponential function um, in which every infected person can infect a certain number of, of other non-immune people, uh, a reproductive number um, a reproduction number uh, greater than one will increase the transmission at an exponential rate, uh, whereas the reproduction number uh, below one decreases transmission, approaching zero new infections uh, over time. So here we can see a few illustrative graphs on what happens to an exponential function when that uh, when that constant um, is above one and when it is below one. Um, so the state uh, is is related to a uh, herd immunity threshold or hit. Uh, which is also a, a function of a disease's reproductive number. Uh, essentially, the higher the reproductive number for that disease, uh, the higher the threshold for population scale immunity. Uh, the population is immune to a disease in excess of that disease's uh, immunity threshold. Uh, the number of cases reduces at a faster rate. Uh, outbreaks are, are less likely to happen, and outbreaks that do occur are smaller than they would have been otherwise. Uh, it's probably important to note that uh, the herd immunity threshold doesn't represent the point at which uh, a disease stops spreading altogether, but rather the point at which uh, each infected person infects fewer than one additional persons on average, uh, essentially modulating the effective reproductive number and diminishing the incidence of disease. So these are useful formulas when, when thinking about vaccine readiness and rollout in situations of emerging disease, where populations begin with virtually no pre-existing immunity. Um, so the effective uh, reproduction rate is, is actually very high uh, and can be brought down by vaccines that are both effective and, and very importantly, available. So what happens when there's no uh, pre-existing immunity? So S is very high and we're, we're met with a disease that has a high basic reproductive number. Well, we are living it with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, since SARS-CoV-2 is a uh, new virus and since it replicates with, with high efficiency, COVID-19's debut has been devastating. Um, COVID's toll on human health won't be fully calculable for years from now, um, but uh, you know, we're still very much in this pandemic globally, uh, where immunization rates are, are low and the effective reproductive rate uh, is greater than one in many places. Again, no, no matter how effective a vaccine is on an individual level, uh, the key to ending pandemics is decreasing R, uh, that effective reproductive rate, uh, which means decreasing the number of susceptible non-immune folks S. So bear in mind that uh, the production, authorization, and rollout of safe and effective vaccines for an emerging disease in under a year is historically unprecedented and, and a very, very good thing. But it's, it's also clear that the costs of not being prepared, both in terms of prevention and in response, those costs are vast and indeed far, far greater than the costs of building the kind of biosecurity infrastructure, including vaccines, uh, that were, you know, we already largely know how to make. It. So I'd like to explore why this infrastructure was lacking uh, and, and then maybe get into some solution oriented ideas. I think it's important also to talk about the ecosystem of vaccine development that existed leading into 2020 and why COVID caught us all off guard despite years and years of, of scientists and people who listen to scientists agreeing that such uh, an outbreak was, was really only a matter of time. So Professor Andrew Lowe um, at MIT, uh, professor of economics there, uh, has done some really interesting analyses on the economic landscape 
of vaccine development over the last few decades, which taken together reveal some interesting insights about why, despite their importance and despite the high rate of technical success in development, uh, vaccines are less than 10% of industrial biotech investment. Um, it turns out that vaccines have a uniquely high probability of success uh, in, in development, close to 40% compared to 11% across all therapeutic groups. But industrial sponsors have been pulling out of the vaccine development business for at least the past two decades. So Professor Lowe and others began to understand that vaccines are a high cost and low financial reward, low margin investment, uh, and, and generally a turnoff for industry, uh, industrial or industry sponsors, biotech, pharmaceutical companies, as well as their investors. So Dr. Lowe and his colleagues point out that these um, analyses of vaccine landscape um, reveal some, some big gaps in investment, um, waning vaccine R&D participation, uh, and ultimately in inhibited vaccine access uh, that, that predate 2020 by a number of decades. Um, and they suggest that public sector support may be useful in, uh, in filling in these gaps left by kind of a lack of capital market incentives. And this itself is a really interesting line of thinking because with what we know about how vaccines leverage network effects at a population scale, lowering S, lowering R, by increasing immunity throughout that population, we can ask, could vaccine development and vaccine innovation be driven by a sort of rethinking of vaccines, not as a market dependent good, but instead as a sort of international public, since they clearly have international public benefits. And since the market incentive structure has failed to make those investments profitable for profit driven developers so far. Anyway, the need for public sector support uh, should probably include scientists, many of whom also happen to be members of the public, many of whom may actually be listening right now. Um, so vaccinology is, is really a constellation of a dozen or so disciplines and fields of science, including public health, epidemiology, immunology, psychology, chemistry, economics, uh, policy, clinical trials, ethics, informatics. We've actually had uh, a couple of physicists reach out and offer to assist us in characterizing uh, our vaccine candidates. So it's clear that there's a need for skilled people of all kinds to take an active part in building global scientific and logistical highway system uh, that can deliver vaccines to populations more quickly with high levels of efficacy, safety, trust, and access. So we at RADVAC took a systems view of the gaps in vaccine infrastructure and across four different elements of the vaccine response, including R&D, testing, approval, and deployment of vaccines. It seems to us that each of these steps could be potentially augmented, improved, sped up, and made more accessible globally by increasing the kind of access and empowers participation in each of those central processes. We believe that the ability to take part is a fundamental prerequisite for things like vaccine equity, inclusivity, transparency, ultimately in trust, safety, efficacy as well. Um, and ultimately in, in uh, developing great ideas about how vaccines work both on a technical level, but also on a systemic worldwide people and kind of global health level. Uh, RADVAC actually began when, when Dr. Preston Isep sent out uh, an email asking me and some of our other colleagues if any of us had heard of projects to accelerate vaccine development through public participation, essentially citizen science. He figured that since vaccines are a fairly old and fairly well understood technology, uh, or at least that many vaccines were built on very well established technological platforms, it might not be out of reach for vaccines to be developed quickly, even on a low budget, uh, maybe even with, you know, massively parallel distributed, um, you know, kind of a, a global scheme. Uh, several of us got really interested in that idea and we formed the core of the RADVAC team. So I'd love to tell you what we've been working on. Um, so we began with a couple uh, principles in mind. Um, you know, uh, because of, of decades of extensive research on both pathogens and on the uh, development of vaccines, um, modern vaccines are actually very quick uh, and easy for experts to develop. Um, and they, they have, again, by far the highest probability of success of, of any therapeutic class. So access to vaccines and the process of developing vaccines, research and development of vaccines, is presently prohibited, right? It's expensive, uh, it's fairly well guarded by uh, intellectual property, again, relating to the expense and, and investors having to recoup uh, their investment. But we, we think that, that Participation should be enhanced and can be enhanced through open source information, uh, research, and resource sharing. 
Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the most powerful uh, principles, motivating principles for us was that, you know, in this, this crisis, we, we should help, right? We should do something uh, rather than waiting for the status quo, rather than waiting for, um, you know, the uh, sort of authoritative pre-existing infrastructure to do its thing. And, uh, and so we did, we are, you know, we are trying uh, and we will continue to try. And, um, you know, our method of trying uh, has a, a kind of a unique structure to it, um, which is sort of intrinsically open source. Open source is kind of a central component of our, our development platform. Um, when we say free and open source, we mean it both in, in free like speech and free like beer, uh, that is the, the libre and the gratis definition. Uh, but essentially, it's it's um, you know it's meant to inspire this sort of uh, positive feedback loop of uh, researching, prototyping, refining, sharing, and then getting feedback from um, other collaborators. Um, you know, throughout this this uh, sort of shared challenge, um, we took into consideration some some sort of basic uh, design principles um, when considering how to develop vaccine candidates that, that fit uh, the needs of, of this pandemic and potentially future pandemics. So uh, we opted for um, you know, safe, inexpensive, accessible, and primarily off-the-shelf materials, very few custom components, uh, and, and very few that required sort of, um, you know, I guess, high grade or, or uh, uh, inaccessible laboratory infrastructure. Uh, we also wanted these, um, these prototype vaccines or vaccine candidates to be rapidly reproducible. Um, that is rapidly producible, but also, uh, you know, with high enough fidelity uh, and enough simplicity that uh, they could be reproduced in other labs so that you could have sort of parallel uh, implementations and, and maybe parallel experiments happening in multiple places at once. Obviously, um, you know, for, for that to work, uh, it has to be safe, uh, both in terms of development, which means uh, no infectious components, uh, and also on the sort of administration side, um, uh, which, you know, also if you uh, are working with safe materials, it certainly helps with uh, safe administration, although those two aren't totally equivalent. Um, we also wanted well-characterized antigenic targets, which could ideally be adapted over time as, uh, as, as more research began um, to, to focus on the selection of certain epitopes that elicited the strongest or the best or the most um, sort of uh, uh, immunologically useful responses from host immune system. And, and uh, you know, all encompassing within this is the idea that, that this work should be shared, right? Uh, and that it shouldn't be contained to a single laboratory or a single team or a single brain. It isn't necessarily against um, the traditional model, but it is potentially enhancing of the traditional model, right? That, um, and we've seen this with other open source developments uh, in other areas, right? That um, the Android operating system leverages open source technology, but Google still makes um, a good amount of money um, either on Android or Android components. So you know, this is not an anti-profit model. It's not an anti-revenue. It's not an anti-business model. It is a pro-sharing uh, and, and sort of pro-accessibility model. So um, in order to catalyze that participation, uh, in mid-2020, we, we published our first white paper describing the initial proposed vaccine candidates against SARS-CoV-2. We had four authors. Uh, the original white paper was 43 pages. We had 84 references, 19, pepito sorry, 19 epitopes uh, uh, from SARS-CoV-2 that were identified in the research uh, or predicted in, in other research uh, to be of high value uh, in terms of eliciting uh, immunogenic response from the host. Uh, we also um, you know, gave kind of a primer on background research um, and, and provided this, this sort of library of pre-existing research on mucosal and cellular and tumoral immunity. Um, uh, again, epitope selection and uh, immunogenicity and resilience against future variants by selecting for conserved epitope. You know, we also went into, uh, you know, not a great length, but considerations for safety and efficacy testing for, for uh, short and long term. Uh, for shelf life and stability, uh, for booster doses, and uh, and for ethics. We think that's important during a global crisis like this. So 
as of 2021, as of July uh, of this year, uh, we've released over a dozen updates to our white paper. Um, we have more than 20 authors, uh, 90 pages, more than 200 references. We've uh, updated and, and in many ways narrowed uh, our list of, uh, of well-characterized epitopes that we think are um, uh, you know, highly useful in eliciting uh, an immunogenic response uh, against SARS-CoV-2 and protective against COVID-19. Um, uh, along that line, we've produced 10 generations of vaccine candidates um, so far. Uh, we've expanded our discussions on safety and efficacy uh, and, and epitope selection and, and booster regimens and heterologous booster regimens, um, optimizing production, optimizing stability, optimizing sort of um, valence or multivalence, where we, uh, we talk about sort of the breadth of immunity that's provided by a vaccine and whether it is resilient against these uh, future variants and, and mutations that, uh, that might otherwise, um, you know, uh, minimize vaccine efficacy. But really, you know, it, it has become uh, a, a collaborative living document and, uh, and, and catalyst for collaborative living research. So I mentioned earlier, um, you know, some of the parallels uh, in, in other open source development and open source uh, initiatives. Um, the Linux, for instance, uh, is, is, you know, kind of a, a great example of, of how uh, we hope we might be able to contribute with uh, with developer kits, right? So Linux clearly um, is is such an infrastructural tool in uh, software development and hardware development, and really uh, promoting accessibility for uh, most of the world at this point. And and it's clear that uh, you know there are reasons that Linux is superior to alternatives uh, that have to do with uh, its open source ness, right? Its collaborative development ecosystem. Um, and uh, the ability for, for multiple people in multiple places uh, to take part without restrictions. So, um, you know, uh, we, we conceptualize um, uh, viruses as sort of non-digital pathogens. It's kind of funny because the name went the opposite way, right? So uh, computer viruses are the, the digital sort of um, appropriation of the actual biological virus. So we're, we're kind of going in the opposite direction now. So, in software developer toolkits, you know, there's a number of, of key features uh, that are really useful, right? Um, uh, Maybe required in order for people to actually like use them and pick them up and, uh, and, and develop cool things with them. So uh, chief among them are a compiler, a debugger, uh, and, uh, and a software framework. Um, and some of the components that, um, you know, are, are critical are libraries, documentation, code samples, processes, and guides. And we think that uh, the vaccine developer toolkit should should mirror uh, and, and encompass all of those components that are essential to collaborative and open source um, and even just good vaccine development. Again, like um, in open source, you don't have to necessarily share and share alike, right? You can take it um, and if you adapt it well enough, you can actually uh, even patent it. You can protect it with IP um, and and even when it is open source, there's no real reason you can't uh, start a company, right? Uh, you, you, you know, you can run with these products in a, in a profit or even you know, revenue driven way. But to put it in context of vaccine development, we think that uh, providing a framework of uh, reproducible, uh, simple, accessible, adaptable vaccine technology uh, is, is really useful. Um, in terms of processes, we want detailed production protocols. In terms of libraries, we want you know, vast documentation of past studies that are related to vaccine immunogenicity, vaccine safety, various aspects of the vaccine technology. Uh, the code samples for us come down to uh, the design specifications for specific vaccine candidates. In terms of debugging vaccine candidates, you got to talk about uh, protocols and considerations for preclinical and clinical testing. And ultimately, it has to play well with others, we think. Um, and, and, you know, this is achievable through open source licensing, like Creative Commons, um, and through an active, engaged, uh, you know, developer ecosystem, um, and, and ideally one that is committed to this concept of, uh, of working together, or at least learning from one another uh, as they each do maybe their own thing. So, you know, along that line, um, we think that our white paper is kind of a, a foundational open source VDK, right? A, a vaccine developer kit. And 
um, it may be that uh, there's there's huge room for improvement in the, the construction and the composition of VDKs. There are certainly components of the white paper that uh, you know uh, don't exist yet, right? We um, we've done a lot to characterize uh, our our method of epitope selection um, and and you know various other things that I've already talked about, but like um, it still kind of lives in a PDF, right? And and um, I don't think PDF is necessarily anyone's preferred format of engaging with um, a project, right? Or or engaging with uh, <laughs> You know, it's not necessarily a collaborative uh, ecosystem in and of itself. So we've started um, a, a researcher's map uh, in hopes of connecting people who are, are interested in doing uh, vaccine development together um, or learning from one another or, uh, you know, sharing ideas, sharing resources and that kind of thing. But really, it, it, it's in its foundational stages. And uh, what I hope to achieve here, uh, you know, is both to to pitch the, the idea that open source vaccine development is useful uh, and achievable, um, but also that, uh, you know, it's worth your time, right? That it, it's worth the uh, the engagement uh, and the efforts of people of all kinds of, of skill sets. Um, so I think that we're at the beginning. Um, I think that we're, we're facing, you know, uh, a variety of possible futures, but one of which is of open source infrastructure for vaccine development. And essentially that infrastructure extending the ability to participate in vaccine research to historically excluded people right um and you know the the the, the costs of exclusion the costs of, of exclusivity in vaccine development are things that we're feeling um you know very acutely during the COVID 19 pandemic um but also that uh you know unless we resolve them are, are not going to be fixable uh, with the old way of doing this. So, uh, you know, it's interesting then to think about what would biosecurity look like if it were decentralized, right? From these sort of centralized nodes of pharmaceutical companies uh, with very, very high budgets um, or potentially very high budgets um, doing, you know, the majority of these, uh, you know, these developments. Um, what if we were able to decentralize that a little bit by bringing down uh, certain infrastructural costs or infrastructural barriers. The VDKs, I think, are, are, are a way to make vaccinology easy, affordable, accessible, and for people who want to start vaccine companies, which may be the only way to get to a billion doses. Um, I, I think, again, by, by reducing those costs, uh, we, can, we can get more people involved. We can see more vaccine innovation. We can see better vaccines that get, get developed and approved faster uh, and, and more effectively. So uh, with that, I thank you. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, that you got something out of the presentation. I hope that you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get curious about what uh, an open source vaccine development future might look like. Uh, reach out to us at radvac.org um, or elsewhere. Um, and uh, thank you for your time.